Hello, and thank you for joining us today for what promises to be an informative and insightful examination of how Pearson Open Class is delivering a fully cloud-based solution for higher education that stimulates social learning and the exchange of content all from one integrated platform. To lead today's discussion, we're honored to have with us two distinguished presenters, Adrian Sanier, Senior Vice President of Product at Pearson Learning Technologies, and Colleen McConaughey, Director of Academic Solutions Consulting at Pearson. Uh, before we begin, a few housekeeping items. You may post a question at any time during the presentation, and we'll try to answer uh, as many as possible at the webinar's end. Uh, any questions we don't get to will be answered by email later. Also, a, a version of this presentation will be archived for future viewing at your convenience. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Adrian Senior is the Senior Vice President of Product at Pearson Learning Technologies, the, the world's largest educational technology company. Previously, he was the University Technology Officer at Arizona State University. Uh, joining us as well today is Colleen McConaughey, Director of Academic Solutions Consulting at Pearson, as a former instructor in higher education at Colorado State and the University of Northern Colorado, she brings an extensive understanding of online education, student engagement, and classroom management. And now, here's Adrian. Well, thanks very much. And thanks to everyone for, uh, for joining us today to talk about OpenClass, uh, Pearson's new cloud-based learning environment that really defines a new model for the creation, adoption, and distribution of learning technology. I have to say, we've been really pleased with the reception that uh, Open Class has received since we announced it at Educause in mid-October of this year. Um, to date, more than 2,000 institutions have uh, activated Open Class for their Google Apps domain in the past month. And there's been a lot of interest in the community and the press around both the Open Class product and the, the new business model that uh, Open Class brings. So we're going to talk about both of those things in some detail today. In my opening remarks, I will cover some of that. And then um, we're going to give you a look at the, the product. Uh, Colleen is going to walk you through some of those details. And then uh, at the end, we are going to, uh, to answer some of the most popular questions about, uh, about Open Class. So, um, so here we go. Open Class is, uh, is a full-featured learning management system that's driven from the cloud that uh, is offered to institutions for free, excuse me, for free. That means no licensing costs, no hosting costs, and no basic support costs either. So Open Class combines the expected administrative functions of an LMS, those are things like grade books and discussion boards and assignment drop boxes, with exciting new social learning features like activity feeds, collaboration tools, something we call share, to provide a fresh yet familiar platform for students and professors to use next generation learning tools. Now beginning in mid-2012, that's sort of the, the coming summer, Open Class will also be opening something we call the Exchange. Now the Exchange is a core capability of the Open Class model, and it, I think the way to think about it is kind of like an integrated app store for education that's finally going to make it easy for faculty to discover new digital tools and approaches and then to quickly adopt them in their teaching and provide seamless access to those things to their students. Now I have to say, I think uh, the question I get most often since we launched Open Class is something along the lines of, what's the trick? Like, tell me the catch. Why would Pearson offer for free something that every other commercial company offers at a considerable price? Even the open source alternatives, the ones that don't really have licensing fees, still have to cover the considerable hosting costs involved in providing LMS services to a campus. And everyone, commercial and open source alike, struggles with doing that reliably, scalably, and cost effectively. So for someone to come along and say, oh, well, we'll take that burden off your hands, we'll do it for free, hey, surely there's some kind of catch. Well, look, I can assure you there's no catch. Pearson has a very good reason for pursuing the open class strategy, one that has its roots in trying to accelerate the digital shift in education. And so I want to try to give you a, a sense for that now. I've spent the last dozen years in higher education. Um, I've been a professor at uh, Arizona and at, Iowa, and, and, and at Iowa State before that. And uh, at both of those places, I was a consumer of education technology. And so, like many of you, I've used a variety of different LMSs and then some supporting technologies 
to try to create an interesting learning experience for my students, both in class and at a distance. Now, not only was I a consumer of these technologies, but as CIO for President Crow at uh, Arizona State, I was also responsible for providing those same services for faculty at, uh, at ASU, which is the nation's largest residential university. And so in those dozen years, both as a consumer and as a provider, I've seen a lot of versions of this software come and go. I've lived through, as many of you have, very expensive and difficult system upgrades technology outages that put campuses in an uproar, various complex integrations. And certainly on behalf of uh, Arizona State, I was responsible for spending tens of millions of dollars to keep those systems up and running. And I have a confession to make. For all those years, with all that effort and all that money, I have to admit that it all made very little difference in the experience of the students that use those systems especially when you compare the way that technology itself has improved so many other things so radically in that same dozen years. Think back on a dozen years ago, the computing platform you were using, the phone that you had in your house, the way you bought TV, the way you looked at media, all of those things blown away. But school, for all of our efforts, it remains as it ever was. So Pearson is transforming itself. Over the last several years, it's been transforming itself from a textbook and testing company to the world's largest educational technology company. And we've come to define ourselves somewhat less by the products that we sell and more by the improvements in student success that we think we can make possible in conjunction with, with professors and with students. Now at Pearson, we're very proud of the digital products that we create, products like the very successful MyMath Lab that every day help millions of college students uh, learn much more from their math homework and help their professors spend much less time grading that math homework and a lot more time helping their students. Now, in the future, we'd like to spend a lot more of our time, of our effort, of our energy, of our resources, helping to develop the future of learning, to move beyond textbooks into what we firmly believe, and what I think many of you believe technology can do to create more effective, faster, richer, and more personalized learning because of the clever and continuously improving application of learning technology. But to do that, the digital shift has to come. The same digital shift that's come to newspapers and media and television and movies, that has to come to education. I have to say that it's hard to find someone who doesn't believe that the future of education is digital. I, over the course of the last year, I must have talked to 50 university presidents. I've talked to 70 or so university provosts, lots of faculty. I'm yet to find someone who says, no, no, 10, 15 years from now, we're all going to still be using textbooks, blackboards, chalk, whiteboards, PowerPoint presentations. That's absolutely, we, we, we're, we're where it's going to be. No, everybody understands that with the arrival of things like the Kindle and the iPad and the Fire and all the other tablets, with the, the shift that's happened in the way that people consume all the other forms of media, that it's very clear that it's going to shift. But when you ask those same folks, but how will it happen? How will we move from a world that is primarily print-based to one that's technology-based? Oh, it's very difficult to talk about how that's going to happen. And last year, at just about this time, in fact, in the room that I'm sitting in right now, the group that was responsible for putting together open class asked ourselves, how can we accelerate that digital shift? That was the question that we tried to figure out. We said, why hasn't the rapid shift to digital, that same shift that's engulfed all those other media businesses, why hasn't that shift affected education? Now, obviously, that's a complex question with a plethora of prospective answers. But when we considered that question ourselves, we started to focus on the failure of the system at the core of most campuses' academic technology stacks, the campus's LMS. That LMS casts individual professors in the role not only of subject matter expert, where most professors are very, very comfortable, but also casts them as instructional designer, content developer, and systems integrator. And when we consider what we ask professors to do, it's absolutely no wonder that we're all hitting our heads on the blackboard in frustration that we're not able to use technology in our classrooms more effectively. In that present LMS paradigm, 
where each school has to deploy, support, scale, and maintain its own LMS, we think there are three points of friction that are preventing the digital shift. The first is how difficult it is for a professor to find digital alternatives in their subject area. Where do you go? How do you figure out what you read? Is it useful for you? Is it not? How can you communicate with the people who created it to understand whether it would be useful to you? There, you have to put tremendous energy into that. And most professors don't have the time, inclination, or interest to put in that kind of energy. The second point of friction is how difficult those digital alternatives are to adopt even once you find them. So you go to a conference and you see somebody presenting on how they took a really cool approach to your particular discipline. What now, Lieutenant? How do you go out there and gather up all this information and, and download it all and put it in some place? And do you have rights and do you not? And who has to pay for what? And how do I put it in my LMS? And what? Look, very, very difficult. And as I say, I've lived that both sides, both as a professor wanting to use things and as a CIO trying to figure out how to deploy sufficient resources to help somebody do something new. There just isn't enough to go around. And then the third point of friction is how hard it is for students to gain access to and support for those digital tools once some professor adopts them. It's very, very difficult and often the burden falls right squarely on top of the professor. Again, a role that they're not really interested in, in providing and nor should we really ask them to provide. Now, schools do try to provide training and assistance, but with so much demand for help and such extreme pressure on budgets, there's just too little to go around. And with every technology adoption, schools repeat the same work of integration over and over again, campus by campus. And to what effect? Simply to slow down the progress. So that led us to the conclusion, these three points of friction, that what would accelerate the digital shift in education is the same thing that accelerated the digital shift in other media businesses a free, open, cloud-based platform that could be used in common by educators and students all over the world that integrated the creation, discovery, collaboration, delivery, and support for digital approaches to education. And that's why we made open class. So we executed on that vision in 2011, and the result for us is open class. It's a completely free, cloud-based LMS that makes it easy for faculty to find digital content and technology recommended by others in their discipline, to collaborate with creators and users of that content technology, and to distribute that content seamlessly to students. Now, we like to say that, uh, that open class is open, easy, and amazing. When we say it's open, we mean it's open to people, to content, and to new ideas. As open class rolls out over the course of 2012, it's our goal to make it available to institutions, to educators, and students from all around the world. We want to make it easy for faculty and students to work with one another, both within and between institutions, as only a cloud-based solution can. When we say we're open to content, we mean content and technology from everywhere. Now, this is another question we get a lot. Oh, I get it. You're making a platform where people can get access to Pearson content. Hey, that won't work for us. If it's just Pearson, we can't possibly use it. Hey, we get it. We absolutely understand that higher ed, the professor in their classroom is king or queen. And whatever they want to choose to use inside their classroom has to be usable, available, possible. And so we put no restrictions on the content that you can use, and we try to make it easy for you to get access to any and all kinds of content. Not only content from Pearson, but also content from other publishers, other commercial technology providers, as well as open educational resources from places like Merlot and Connections. We're confident that at Pearson, we can make products that are worth money. And we can make products that are worth money that will compete favorably in this new landscape because we believe we can affect student success and we know that that is the coin of the realm. And so we relish the opportunity to learn from the best uses of learning technology regardless of their point of origin in open class. Open class is entirely web service driven. And so we also say that open class is open to new ideas because we welcome schools, institutions, faculty, students, content creators to utilize those services to create the best possible learning experiences that leverage the various underlying capabilities of open class. So in addition to being open, we like to say that open class is easy. And when we mean easy, we say, look, it's got to be easy to begin using open class. You know, I'm really proud of the fact that 
that less than a month, well, a little over a month since EDUCAUSE, 2,000 institutions have been able to, to adopt open class into their domain and begin using it immediately. That's easy. That's the kind of easy that we're talking about. What, cater what characterizes uh, adoption in this, uh, in this LMS world otherwise is months of work. And so to be able to, uh, to adopt a new uh, technique, technique or capability within minutes, uh, we think is a big paradigm changer. And so we think we have, uh, we'll make it easy to get started, easy to find and interact with students and, and faculty. Our teams have worked hard to create a system that's simple and familiar for faculty to teach and for students to learn. We spent a lot of time instrumenting open class to develop a basis for providing useful information to faculty, students, administrators, and content creators, and we can gather that information across use cases that exist in the institutions and between them, and we think that'll make the data landscape that we gather much richer. And with the launch of the exchange this summer, we'll make it easier than ever before to gain access to world-class digital content. All of this adds up to something we think will be amazing. We think it's going to be amazing what will happen in education with the arrival of the digital shift. We here at Pearson believe that student outcomes can rise, and dramatically. We believe that more people will be able to learn more things faster and more completely. And we want Open Class to help facilitate that shift, to empower innovators in education wherever they come from, eliminate boundaries to the creation, distrib distribution, and continuous improvement of teaching and learning. We really believe that a new age in education is about to dawn. And we think that its impact in the course of the world will be no less dramatic than the digital shifts we've seen transform all the other aspects of our lives. So for the beta launch of open class that we announced at EDUCAUSE, um, we focused on a set of institutions around the world that had already adopted a cloud-based solution for education, the Google Apps for Education suite. We felt that those institutions had already embraced cloud provisioning of services and that they welcomed the advantages of partnership with a leading technology provider. And so over the course of, uh, of uh, the spring and summer, we worked closely with a group of engineers from the Google Apps team to create a deep integration with the Google tools. Through, a, uh, through the Google Apps marketplace, as I mentioned, schools can activate open class for their domain in just a few minutes. So no complicated installs, no upgrades, no data center migrations required. Over the course of 2012, we're going to be expanding availability of open class beyond the boundaries of that Google App universe, first on an invitation basis, and then working over the year toward full and open availability to all institutions. Now, of course, when we do open it, the OC will continue to be available for free. I know that it seems that it's got to be a trick. No, you don't really mean for free, but absolutely no licensing costs, no hosting costs. We think it's critical to be able to spread the adoption, and it is part of the value proposition that the open class approach provides. When we think about what's in it for everybody, I hope I've made clear what's in it for Pearson. Pearson feels it will gain a wider market for its products and help accelerate us toward the digital future that we think we can play a, a founding and framing role in. We also think it will create a greater market for digital technologies more broadly and for those kinds of content and services all throughout education. What do institutions get? Well, right off the bat, they gain a state-of-the-art capability that gives them a strategy for the conversion to digital, all the while saving hundreds of thousands to even millions of dollars a year by providing this capability for free. Faculty gain greater access to digital tools and to a community that builds them giving them the opportunity to improve their students' learning experience without the headaches involved in acting as their own systems integrator. In the end, we want students to gain the most important thing of all, which is increased success. And we believe that in conjunction with, uh, with leading innovators and also with uh, faculty and instructors around the world, that we can start to, to deliver on that promise. Um, we've already announced a broad collection of technology and content partners that will be offering uh, their, their tools and capabilities through Open Classes Exchange as we bring that online. That exchange approach will allow professors to choose the tools and content that work for them without having to see those adoptions happen for the entire university. We think this is going to accelerate the adoption of those kinds of technologies and also accelerate the creation of technologies that are discipline specific because it makes it much more straightforward for professors to choose to use them in their individual classes 
and we're excited to facilitate a future like that. Now, I've mentioned a lot during the course of my remarks the, uh, the role that our design partners have played in helping us frame the capabilities of the solution in, how, in terms of helping us shake it out before making it available more broadly, and also in terms of helping us think through how to put together the exchange and the other social features of the platform. Um, these design partners have been instrumental for us. Um, faculty at these institutions have provided a lot of advice and evaluation of the OC, and many of them have already begun teaching courses inside it. We're very grateful to the guidance that those institutions have provided so far, and in fact, we're looking forward to their uh, visit here to uh, Denver in two days' time to uh, help us frame our strategy for 2012. So we thank them uh, very much for their support. Um, what I'm going to do now is turn over the uh, proceedings to my colleague, Colleen, who is going to walk us through some of the features of the platform. And then uh, after Colleen is done, we will have time to take a few, a few questions. If it hasn't come through in my remarks so far, the team here in Denver is completely passionate about the difference that we think open class can help to make in this marketplace, and we're looking forward to working with any and all of you. Excellent. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, we'll go ahead now and start a demonstration of open class. I'm very excited to be able to present this to you today. As you look at this first page, uh, you're looking at the personalized home page, the overall school or university view uh, for this particular user. Uh, in the right hand, top right-hand corner, you'll see uh, the name Ingrid. I'm logged in today as Dr. Ingrid Wells, and I'll be speaking from Dr. Wells' perspective throughout our demonstration. As we review this main page, you'll see that we have a course toolbar towards the top, a course listing on the left-hand side, and then a social environment on the right-hand side. We're going to get, go ahead and get started today by showing you how easy it is to create a course. By selecting the Create a Course button at the bottom of the course listing, uh, a, a box appears called Create a Course, where you can simply insert your course title, your course code, call number, the number of credits, as well as the term start and end date. In addition, you can easily enter in a course description for your course that allows your students to understand uh, exactly what the course is going to be about, um, as well as any other information um, pertaining to the course. Once I select that Submit button, my course is ready to go, and it appears on my course listing. Another way that you could add a course into, uh, into Pearson Open Class is by selecting Create a Course is, and um, editing to import the content from um, other LMSs such as Blackboard, Angel, as well as Moodle. As you look at our import content in, um, intro, you'll see that this is a business policy course. This import contra content tool allows instructors to easily be able to um, import their courses from another LMS so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. As Adrian was speaking, we wanted to make sure that the, the LMS was easy to use, and Pearson Open Class makes it extremely easy. By simply selecting this button, your courses are easily imported into Pearson Open Class. Returning back to the personalized homepage, we'll now look a little bit over the social part of our uh, Pearson Open Class. As you look at the activity listing, you'll see that Brad King, Ingrid Wells, Glenn Griffin have all submitted assignments or remarks into their courses. The information that you're seeing on the activity feed is being pulled in from the courses on the left-hand side that the user is enrolled or either instructing. As you look at this activity feed, this is constantly changing throughout the day. <clears throat> However, filters make it very easy for an instructor or for a student to see the information that they want. Now, as I said, throughout our demonstration, I'm going to be speaking from a, from a faculty member's perspective. However, this page would look, very, would look exactly the same for a student, except for the information would be de different depending upon the courses that they were enrolled in. Um, moving over now to the people side, as you select the people tab, you'll also see users who are online or offline. I can, of course, group these by online status um, or as well as courses, and I can determine to find a student or find a particular user by entering in their name. As you look at the online and offline st students, you'll see graphics have been added, so pictures can also be placed in open class. Um, as you look at online and offline users, as long as your user or your students, teachers, or faculty administrators are online, you have the ability to be able to chat and Skype with them. 
As you can see, Brad King is currently online, and I could send a chat to Brad King, such as questions about homework. Um, this would be great for interactions, quick interactions in terms of don't forget to study for the test. Did you need any help? I saw you left me an email. So you could definitely quickly enter in uh, quick, quick chat messages. Not only one chat message uh, can go in here, you can have several going at one time, and those would appear as different tabs. If we were to select on Brad King as an individual student, you could see all of the activity that Brad has been uh, participating inside of his courses, but you could also learn a little bit more about Brad by selecting the About Me tab. Uh, for example, you'll see that Brad has entered in some information about what he's majoring in, as well as his educational information, and so if you were to scroll down on this page, as well as employment information. We're going to be talking about profile in just a little bit. As you look at the activity from Brad King and um, the participation that he's been um, participating in his different courses, you'll see the different remarks, as well as quizzes and assignments discussions that have been posted. Returning to the tool part towards the top of the screen, you'll see that we have a seamless integration with Google. I can access my uh, Gmail messages uh, right from the top hand uh, toolbar. As you look at that top right hand toolbar, you'll see a little envelope, and those are the, the Gmail messages that are being pulled in from my Gmail account. I can also review the different upcoming events inside of my courses. Um, this is a great place to post uh, virtual office hours as well as group reminders of projects that are, be that are due. So I could access my uh, Gmail calendar right from that top right-hand toolbar. Next, I can also access my Google Docs. So as my different students uh, submit group presentations, financial models, assignments, uh, sign-up sheets, all of those documents could be accessed from here as well. Now again, from a student perspective, if I had uh, you know, student assignments or group-led presentations, my Google Docs would appear differently for me, uh, but I could still access them from this top toolbar. Finally, the last piece of the dashboard that we're, we're going to talk about on this right-hand side is the ability to edit your profile. So you'll see right now, I, as I select Edit Profile, Dr. Uh, Wells' picture appears. I could change my picture from here, and I can also change um, information about me. One of the most important features that we felt uh, was uh, very necessary for Pearson Open Class was the ability for an instructor or for a student to make sure that they could change their privacy settings. So at any time, I could select to share my profile with my classmates or share my online status with my classmates by checking that. But if I wanted to work inside of my course so that I could grade a lot of papers or participate in discussions without my students or my other classmates knowing, I could simply uncheck this privacy text, uh, uh, box. The next tool that we're going to be looking at is also found on the dashboard, and this is the Share tool. As you look at the share tool, you will see a stream of all posts. Dr. Wells has submitted a post on top 10 advice for young entrepreneurs, but as you look below Dr. Wells' posting, you'll see that Gary, who is a student, has posted a blog. This is the first time in an LMS that a student can really take ownership of their learning experience by being able to post posts on their own, meaning they could start discussions, they can uh, post interesting blogs, content, and information, and they have the ability to be able to share this with not only students that are enrolled in one of their courses, but as well as communicating with students that are in classes that they are not enrolled in. The share tool is really unique and one of a kind in that you can also add comments as well as tag information, making it easy to search for tags as you can see on the bottom right hand side. Creating a post is easy and as you look at the create a post, you'll see that a, a person that would like to uh, create a post can enter in a title and then use a basic visual editor to create their post. Uh, they can then share this with a school or uh, share with a particular class as well. As you look at the right-hand side, you will see that I also have the ability to follow uh, individual users. This includes teachers, administrators, as well as students. And if you look at Dr. Wells, she right now has posted a couple times into the stream, has following of, uh, 25 different students, and has a pretty good follower um, uh, selection as well. 
as you review this, you can see the pictures, you can see who's following, and at any time you could select to unfollow a student or if unfollow another teacher or administrator. It keeps tracks of the post as well as followers and following. Returning to the share tool, you will also see uh, that as um, more students respond to the different posts through the share tool, their remarks appear, and um, you can continue to have those discussions then all through that mainstream. Let's go ahead and step inside of an accounting course, one of the courses that I have created. As you look at your course homepage, you'll see that on the left-hand side, it has, holds all of the content and course tools for this class. The middle section shows you the activity as well as people that are connected to my accounting course. And on the right-hand side, I have all of my announcements, what's upcoming, and for review. We're going to spend uh, just a couple minutes on this uh, main course homepage before moving into content as well as course tools and then how to get started in Pearson Open Class. As you look at the middle section, you'll see in this course home the activity stream that shows all of the activity that's taking place inside of this particular class. Now before, when we were at uh, the, the school, that main page, we were looking at activity for all of the courses that the teacher or student was either teaching or enrolled in. Now we've been able to narrow it to just this course home, making a very social and interactive environment. What we have found through working with our design partners as well as re research on how students want to be able to engage in their classes, we've found that students are now not only just taking place or taking, uh, participating in their class at a certain hour of the day, they're participating in their courses throughout the entire day. Uh, you'll see that this activity feed constantly updates uh, with different remarks, different discussions, as well as activity postings. The next tab is the People tab, and I have the ability to be able to see who is currently online and offline within my class as well. You'll also notice the chat and the Skype button underneath Brad King's name since he is currently logged in and is online. Other additions to the course home, on the right-hand side you'll see announcements that can be marked as unread or read. Uh, a great feature of our announcements section is that it also goes to our can, um, you can review those through our mobile site. And so a mobile site can, is also found in open class, making it easy to review announcements, grades, discussions, and content all from your mobile phone. The middle section right under uh, announcements is upcoming. That's letting you know what's coming up. Do you have a quiz due? Do you have a presentation? Do you have an assignment? And so all of those events would appear under the upcoming heading. On the bottom right-hand section is a section uh, dedicated just for teachers, and this is a for review. As you look at the for review, it alerts the teacher um, what assignments need to be graded as well as quizzes. As a teacher, this is one of my favorite sections because I don't have to search through my entire class to find what I need to grade. It simply appears on that course home for me, making it easy to grade hundreds of students at one time. Now that we've covered the course home, let's move over to the left-hand side, uh, commonly referred to as the navigation tree, ho housing all of the content. Um, putting content into Pearson Open Class is very easy. With that being said, um, you are not tied to Pearson content in Pearson Open Class. You can, of course, put in content from a variety of uh, different publishers and as well as remembering the course conversion tool uh, through being able to import uh, courses that you've already created. As you select the modify gear towards the top left-hand side of that navigation tree, a box will appear allowing you to arrange, add, style, and restore your content. As you look at the first tab, the arrange tab, you will see that you have the ability to be able to move content, uh, select to be able to show content or keep content hidden from your students, select to make an item gradable, select to make a content item available to submit so that a student would um, need to receive a grade for that content item, and you also have the ability to archive any of your content items. Let's take a look at how easy it is to add content in Pearson Open Class. By selecting the Add tab, you now can select from a menu item that includes the ability to import content pages or create content pages inside Open Class, create threaded discussions, uploaded content, uh, you can select to have the content be gradebook item only, 
as well as an assessment tool. You can easily move any of these different pieces of content into a variety of different places inside of your class. So as you look at this, you can, just, you can select to add to a main level or within a class such as a week um, or even nesting that item further into a, a, a subheading of a week item. Now as you look at weeks, as you re return back to the course home and you'll see that left hand side, you'll see that I've organized this class by weeks. However, you have the ability to name these chapters, units, but you could also name this the sky is blue, the grass is green, the sun is yellow. It's really up to you and it allows for you to be able to design your class how you want to design it. Uh, looking next, we're going to take a look at the syllabus tool that is also inside of Open Class. You have the ability to easily be able to import your course syllabus so that students uh, know the textbooks that you're using as well as how to contact you. So email and phone would rarely be used because Open Class makes it so easy for, to quickly chat with students um, as well as uh, video collaboration right within Open Class as well. Within the course tools, we also have the ability to um, offer ebooks inside of Open Class. And as you think about being able to put in textbooks from uh, publishers other than Pearson, we, we are also able to do that through in several integrations that we have. Uh, as you consider eBooks and you think about the eBooks that you would like to place inside of your class, uh, you'll see more of, uh, about eBooks coming up in this next year and in integrations that we can use inside of Open Class. The next tool we're going to review is collaboration. And as you look at collaborations, uh, we make it very easy for students and teachers to be able to create collaborative spaces. Uh, what you're looking at right now is an accounting class that has broken into um, a, a project where students have to participate in reviewing different companies. So you'll see that Group B, Butterfield Companies, that group has been uh, created through here. As you select Show Details on that right-hand side, it will expand and allow you to be able to see the group members that are connected with this particular group. You can see on the right-hand side, I also have the ability to share uh, certain documents with just this group. So as you think of groups and group assignments, um, as you know, students uh, moving into group projects and being able to collaborate with one another, um, we wanted to also leave it open to students being able to start these groups. So not only do instructor, instructors have the abilities to be able to create these groups, students do as well. Looking at this next piece, you'll see that you can easily add people to your collection and select to add them as a writer or just a reader so that if you didn't want them to be able to have authoring capabilities, you could certainly select to do that. The next tool is the gradebook, and as we review the gradebook, you'll see that it's very easy to see, to share the grades with the students, assign points, as well as letter grades, leave comments, and as you, if you were to select the details view, of course, you could leave additional comments, um, as well as uh, feedback. This course tool at any time can be expanded by selecting the arrow button that points to the left hand side of left corner of the screen. So right now I'm still in my class, but I've actually expanded my course tool to take up the full screen. Uh, nothing is more difficult uh, than being in an LMS and only having a very small view of your gradebook. I'm now able to expand this, allowing me to see all of my students as well as the comments. But if I wanted to return to the minimized view, I simply select that arrow again, and it returns me to the minimized view. The gradebook allows you to be able to grade uh, hundreds of students easily at one time. And uh, again, when you continue to review Pearson Open Class, you'll see even more enhancements to this wonderful tool within this next year. The next piece is a content item that I have embedded a, a Google document right inside of my class and it's a sign-up sheet for a group presentation that my class has. You'll see the date, the time, and the group number, and again, this is a Google Doc. So my students could find this Google Doc by, um, again, accessing the Google Docs at the top right-hand corner. Um, and at any time, because I can make my course tools full screen, as I select that uh, little, the arrow that's pointing to that top left-hand corner, you'll see that I can expand content items too. 
So students can count now come into this uh, content item, add a time and a date of when their group wants to present. And I can save this all inside of my course through Google Docs. As I select that uh, top, that arrow again, it returns me to the minimized view of this content. And you'll see many different ways to be able to add uh, different pieces of content inside of uh, Pearson Open Class as we continue to demonstrate today. Our next tool is uh, the exam, our exam builder right inside of Open Class. And as you look at this page right now, you're seeing um, an overview of the performance metrics on this particular exam. You'll see mean and mode, as well as highest and lowest score. You can see how many people have taken the class, as well as their percentage of score. So this gives you some great basic level uh, statistics as to how your students are succeeding in completing their exams. If I were to select the top right-hand modify button, at any time I can manage my exam to be able to create questions, uh, schedule my exam, configure, as well as change the introduction of my exam. So as you look at this screen, towards the bottom you'll see for this quiz one, I have all of the, um, the standard uh, exam question types, multiple choice, true, false, fill in the blank. Those are all auto-gradable as well as then short answer and essay that an instructor would need to grade. The blue buttons, the plus, the pen, um, the X, as well as the arrow pointing up and down, allow you to easily be able to edit your exam so that you can place your questions where you want them to and you can make changes as needed. The top section shows you how I have the ability to be able to schedule my exam. So I have my start date as well as end date. I can select when I would like to re review my exam as well. I have the ability to be able to configure my exam, um, including uh, the ability for students to take the exam multiple times or setting a time limit, as well as creating exams with multiple pages. And finally, the introduction section allows me to access our uh, visual editor so that you can make changes to your introduction. With that being said, you can also place graphics and pictures and widgets inside of our Pearson Open Class exam tool. And there is no limit as to the, no the amount of graphics, images, or movies, videos that you want to place inside of your course. That's right, I'll say it again, no limit. That means you, won't, um, you will never access access a, uh, an error box that will say you've reached capacity. That will never happen in open class. Returning now to our main page, uh, you will see that I also have the ability to be able to import um, engaging um, lectures that includes audio, uh, the ability for students to be able to print as well. Uh, this is a, from a Pearson Course Connect course. Of course, you also have the ability to put in your own lectures. And as you look at the left-hand side, you'll also see the nesting capabilities of content. So although I have, um, for week one, I have an accounting principles lecture, I have a variety of other pieces of content that are nested underneath, such as listen, watch, income statements. So we do have nesting in here in open class as well. The last piece of content is the ability to be able to um, upload documents that are cur currently exist on your PC laptop and you can put in Excel, Office documents, as well as PowerPoint as well. To join Open Class, you can access this through our Google Apps Marketplace. So if you are a Google Apps school right now, um, getting started in Open Class is also easy to do. To wrap up our demonstration today, as Adrian said, we hope that you have found through our demonstration that Open Class is easy, open, and amazing. Uh, open to the, to the users, to the students and teachers that you want to add into your class, including guest lectures, or if you just wanted to share your course with another colleague, it's as simple as adding in another user. That it's easy, that we've, we've made it intuitive for you to be able to use, easy to import content for courses that you've already created, easy to be able to add content, as well as content from other publishers, eBooks, and use of our tools, and the amazing. Amazing not only because it's free, but more importantly because when you are using your learning management system every day, you should be saying, this is amazing. I'm now going to turn the, the demonstration back over to Adrian and Katie. So I think uh, what we're going to do now is try to get to some of the questions that have come up during the, uh, during the presentation. There's an awful lot of them, so it's 
very clear we won't be able to get to each one in its turn. I'm sorry about that. But we will choose some of the most popular ones. Um, how do we want to begin that, Dave? <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Adrian. Um, like you said, we'll entertain a few questions uh, here from our audience in the, in the time remaining. Um, Adrian, maybe you can answer this question. This, this questioner wants to know, um, um, they're, they're part of a dental hygiene program, a school within a school, if you will. Uh, she wants to know, can her department use open class without the entire school using it? Um, yes. Uh, I think that at, at this stage of the game, um, at, at the stage of, of release that we are, if the dental school is already or seeks to be a, uh, a user of Google Apps, then it would be a very straightforward thing for them to enable that in our domain. Um, if, uh, if the school is not, then over the course of this year, um, we're going to be inviting certain schools that are not yet uh, Google Apps users or that, that are not Google Apps users to, uh, to work with uh, open class, and over the course of next year, we'll be opening up that generally. And so, yes, it would certainly be possible for a school within a school to use it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Colleen, this, this uh, questioner wants to know, uh, to what extent is it possible to edit the look of a course page? That is, can, can uh, he make his course look different from other courses? Um, let me, to, to, to uh, answer that question, I'm going to introduce uh, Katie Kapler, who is the, uh, the product lead on Open Class. And so I think she can give us some insight into customizability. Katie? Sure. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so there's a few ways to customize Open Class. Specifically inside the course context, um, a lot of flexibility in terms of the navigation and the content that's put into that navigation, as um, Colleen showed you. We'll also be, over the course of the next um, few quarters, rolling out additional features that allow you to customize, let's say, the colors of that course or apply um, style sheets that modify the style a little bit. Beyond that, we also want to make Open Class flexible um, and customizable at a different level. And that's when we really start to think about the API program and the developer program that's going to sit alongside and on top of Open Class. So by exposing um, a set of services, a set of APIs that provide access to information and the ability to interact with the tools of open class, um, we'll also allow our partner institutions to create customizations that sit outside of this classroom, um, but continue to interact with the tools and technology inside the open class system. Uh, Katie, while we got you on the line here, um, this question wants to know, um, how much of open class is, is open source? How much freedom does an individual school have to customize it? Yeah, so so along the same lines of the the previous question, while the the co well, so there's a couple of ways that we'll go about that. Um, the first really is that developer and API program, um, rather than open sourcing all of the code of Open Class, where you would have to then download it, host it yourself, maintain it, ongoing. Um, we're going to do all of that for you here at Pearson, hosting it and maintaining that code. But we will provide you access to all of the data and tools inside Open Class through this API layer. So those APIs and services give you a tremendous amount of flexibility in terms of building customizations and extensions to the platform. Um, in some cases, we'll also take pieces of code that we've developed, for example, um, as we roll out our mobile strategy, and we will open source those uh, tools in, in our, as part of our developer program um, so that our partners can take that code as a starting place to either understand how to interact with the APIs or to, to really as a foundation for an application that they might want to extend and customize themselves. Uh, this is uh, Adrian. In a way, the approach that we've decided to take uh, combines some of the open source approach with the open API approaches that people like Google and Amazon have taken. What we're, what we're thinking schools really want to do is be able to create customized learning experiences for their students. And so the code that is most important to have freedom to modify is the code that brings the user experience to your students and to your faculty. And so that's the reason that when we, when we built the uh, the user experience that Open Class delivers, we built the entire experience on top of a set of web services. And that set of web services we will expose to partner institutions and to developer partners to make it possible for them to recreate any part of that experience that they would like. We think that that, uh, that level of openness is, is preferable to having 
essentially open access but also the responsibility to maintain not only the code that reaches out to the user but also the code that's at the core of the system. And so when we look at the success of open APIs like Amazon and Google who have been able to create a set of reliable services that then can be remixed to create a wide variety of experiences, it's that blend of, of open source and open API that we're trying to, to strike. Mm -hmm. Uh, will open course be available for universities that, that are not currently Google clients? Um, yes, this is Adrian again. We will uh, be providing open class outside of the Google the Google Apps universe uh, in the latter half of uh, of uh, 2012 as we work toward full uh, open access to to open class. Just a word about why we chose to uh, to begin in a, in a restricted way. We want very much. To, uh, for open class to meet the desires and the needs of the community. And so we're essentially opening up in a concentric set of rings. We began with our design partners who provided us a tremendous amount of insight and feedback. We've now expanded that universe to include a, a set of 2,000 schools that we're learning a lot from. As we learn those things, uh, we can increase in our, in our uh, scalability and our availability. Um, this questioner would like to know, uh, does OpenClass require hosting and customization like Moodle? Um, so this is Katie again, and the answer to that is absolutely not. So all of the hosting, all of the maintenance, all of the support is done here um, by Pearson. And so there, there's no need to um, install the application on campus or to continue to support it from that standpoint. And so there is a considerable savings to institutions both small and large in terms not only of licensing costs averted, but also hosting and, uh, and support costs. Uh, thanks. This, uh, this question would like to know, uh, who will be administering the exchange? Will, will Pearson offer only first-party apps there, or will it also offer third-party apps? Will Pearson receive a, a cut of the revenues from these third-party apps? Well, so the, the, uh, the exchange is a, is a thing that we're designing in conjunction with our design partners to make sure that it will meet the needs of the community. And so we want to make sure that exchange has uh, uh, the right blend between, say, the way Apple runs the exchange and the way, uh, the way Apple runs their app store and the way that uh, Android runs its app store. The difference there being that, on the one hand, Apple takes a more restrictive view that things have to be submitted to them and then, and then placed in the exchange. Most, most uh, reviewers would say that the result is that Apple has control over what's in the exchange, but it means that the quality of things that are in the exchange is, is pretty high and that it makes the, the recommendations and, the, and the, the things that you find there somewhat more reliable. Android takes a much more open view. And while open is very appealing to the educational community, at the same time, if inappropriate content or content that might offend or, you know, in other ways sort of compromise the, the integrity of the exchange, that would be a problem. And so we're looking for a way to, uh, to administer the exchange to gain some of the benefits of both. But one of the things that we're certain about is that we want to try to provide the broadest possible access to to content and services through the exchange to make it really easy for both free content, content from other publishers, and content from Pearson to be adoptable. All of that said, if there was a piece of content that you wanted to use and it wasn't currently supported by the exchange, that would in no way prevent you from using that within your course or from sharing it with, uh, with other people inside of the, the open class system. So again, the exchange is designed to make it really easy to find things and we're going to try to make it the richest and and, uh, and most robust capability that we can, but uh, a, an individual professor will always have the ability to utilize whatever content uh, they, can, uh, they can obtain by whatever means. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, this questioner wants to know um, how they can get access to Open Class for the spring 2012. Yes, this is Katie again. Um, so open classes, if you are an institution that has Google Apps for education on campus, Google, um, open class is available to you today. Uh, just go to the Google Apps Marketplace and search for open class, and um, your IT administrator can uh, adopt the uh, open class solution right from there. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, this question I would like to know, um, will they have a rights to the content that's posted in open class? 
Um, so just as with any um, learning management system, the content that individual professors create and put into the system is theirs, and they continue to own all rights to that content. Um, if a, a professor chooses to share some of their content in the learning exchange, they may do so, and at that point they'll, be, they'll have the option to decide under what rights they, they wish to share that content out with others. But that is strictly an opt-in um, process, so you know, if, if they want to keep their content private, they have the ability to do so. Mm -hmm. um, this questioner wants to know, um, how do we know that Open Class is going to be here in two, 2013 if we switch in 2012? Well, certainly, you know, speaking as a CIO, when you, when you evaluate any piece of technology, you, uh, you have this question of how do I know that this capability will survive? And that's true no matter whether you buy a product from a startup company, whether you buy a product from a company that has recently developed a product, or whether you buy a product from a company that's had it in play for a very long time. The question of whether that product will be around and whether it will continue to meet your needs is, uh, is, a, is a question that uh, is at the core of any technology evaluation. One of the things that I think makes Open Class a particularly uh, strong candidate for consideration is the pedigree of the company that it comes from. Uh, Pearson is the undisputed leader in this field, in the area of educational technology. It's the largest by an order of magnitude of any other that uh, you might compare to. And we have a solid track record in providing uh, technology of this kind at scale for more than a decade. So I think that there are some very strong reasons. I think that um, each institution will evaluate according to a very complex set of, uh, of criteria, and we welcome the opportunity to come out and discuss with an institution why open class would be a terrific choice. And certainly, it makes a very impressive showing in RFPs when its price tag comes rolling in. Mm -hmm. yeah, this, uh, <clears throat> This audience member wants to know, uh, will there be batch tools available to import users? Yes, there will. Um, so there are, there are today and there will um, in the future be lots of ways to get users courses and enrollments into open class. So today there is an administrative area. We didn't um, have time to include that in the demonstration, but there is a space where administrators can go, also go to create courses and users and manage enrollments on behalf of their professors and students. Um, in the next few weeks, we'll be releasing batch tools to that same area, so you'll be able to, for example, upload a simple CSV file with that same information to create um, groups of users, courses, and enrollments. And then um, along those same lines, uh, over the next few months, we'll be working on a set of um, APIs that support integration, direct integration to a student information system. Um, so you would be able to hook up your um, SIS to open class to automatically manage all of that communication without requiring any intervention from an administrator. And with that question, we'll end today's webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank our guests for sharing their insights, and thanks to you, our audience, for attending.